audience. We really appreciate your time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grace Young and her students. <laughs> for coming. Uh, Ashley D. Herrera is a junior and a double major in sociology and psychology, and she's from Center, Colorado. She developed this project in the sociological research methods class, and it's a class that's devoted to a semester-long research project, and students conduct original research, and they can choose a qualitative or a quantitative uh, research approach, and Ashley uses the ethnographic qualitative method. She was chosen to present her research at the Ivy Plus Symposium at Harvard University two weeks ago, and she um, put up the, uh, um, what she presented. Um, and this is a conference of 150 college students who get the chance to present and to receive feedback about their research. And the symposium's purpose is to create a pathway for a more diverse group of scholars to move into graduate level work. And so, Ashley is also a Gates Millennium Scholar, and we are very pleased to have her present her research. Um, as Professor Young said, I'm Ashley D. Herrera. Um, my project, I did an ethnographic exploration of parents and children in public spaces. When I started doing my research and trying to decide what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to focus on families. And whenever I was doing my research, I realized that there was a big emphasis on the home life and how parents are and their children are in the home. But there was an underemphasis of public settings and how these families interact in a public environment. Um, so for my project, I, I decided to do an ethnography. And I focused on family time, which I'll define later, as well as in how different demographic differences affect the family time and how different demographics organize their family time. Um, so the researcher Daly, she, uh, she looked at family time and she defined it as quality time for recreational purposes. Um, she realized that in the past, families did everything together. They cooked together, they hunted together, they mourned together, they did everything together. But in the industrialization and um, moving away from agriculture, it became more work-based and more focused on income and family time kind of took, fell to the wayside a little bit. But in recent time, family is becoming more of a coveted concept. We're so busy, but we also want to spend more time with our children. Um, we want to, because you know, research says that if you, the more time you spend with your children, the better they are developmentally. So it's become a coveted concept to spend time with them. Deval did a project just like I did. She actually looked at families in a public zoo. And her significant finding was that families move in an amoeba-like fashion, which means they gather themselves into a group and they move from exhibit to exhibit together. Nobody really goes into their little invisible boundary and their, ch their children aren't allowed to go outside of their invisible boundary. Conger, Conger, and Martin found the family stress model, so, or kind of developed this family stress model, which says that when there's economic hardships, there's more stress on the family. So. If there's more stress in the family, more economic stresses, then that's less time that they spend, you know, good time that they spend with their children for their development. The investment model, it was pretty much how the more economic resources you have, the more wants you can give your children and their desires. Whereas if you have low economic resources, you're focused on their immediate needs, their food, their clothing, shelter. Um, so it's just this balance of trying to balance the economic resources and their immediate needs versus what they want. Jansen looked at discipline, so it, between different demographics. Men, she found, are more physically disciplining and insulting, whereas women are more verbally disciplining and threatening. So pretty much a man will actually spank their child, whereas a woman will threaten to spank their child, just as an example. She also found that, that lower socioeconomic status individuals, they have more reported use of harsh discipline compared to any other class. So what I did, I spent approximately 12 hours at the sand and swimming pool, which most of you know is in Hooper, Colorado. Um, I was strictly an observer. I just watched, and actually I work there. So I, me watching them didn't seem very odd. They thought that I was just making sure they weren't drowning, pretty much. Um, <laughs> But I just observed the customers while I was working. I worked it out with my boss at an hour at a time through a few shifts. I would watch the families in, uh, um, at the pool. 
like I said, it's been approximately 12 hours. I would focus on one family at a time. I would move from one family to the next family to the next family. Um, I kept a, sh like a small journal with me that I wrote down all my field notes, really shorthand dialogue. And then when I got home, I would detail all of the things that I found into a type version. And at the end, I looked for what I decided to look at was gender, socioeconomic status, and race, and how those three different demographics <coughs> changed how families interact with each other in a public environment. So as for demographics, there were a lot of different people that I looked at. There were nuclear families, so mom, dad, children. Um, there's families that I called solo parents, so there was a father in the picture, there was a mother in the picture, they just weren't there at the time, as well as single parents where the other parent was either out of the picture or they were separated. Um, the age ranged in both parents and children. There was young parents, old parents, young children, old children. Um, the majority were either Caucasian or Hispanic. And th I decided that I really wanted to look at socioeconomic status, but I couldn't necessarily go up to people and say, hey, how much money do you make every year? <laughs> so I decided to quantify it by seeing how much money they spent. in Because the, there's a, a restaurant and a concession stand inside of the pool. So I saw how much money they spent in there. Did they bring their own food or did they bring food? Did they buy candy, did they not buy candy? Did they let their children get swim toys or not? Um, do they have a swim pass or did they just pay as they go? I looked at those different things and categorized them into middle class or lower working class or high spending versus low spending. Um, so what I found. Um, I found the same as Devault with the fam familial boundaries. I found that parents would produce these invisible boundaries around themselves where their children weren't allowed to leave and others weren't allowed to enter. And just the same, if the family moved, the children moved with them. It, wasn't, it didn't take long for a child to realize that, oh, my parents are swimming away, I should probably swim away too. Um, so there's one example with the Robinsons and I've renamed all of the families that I l looked at, but just so I can organize it. Um, so the Robinsons, I've had a lot of problems with this family. They don't really watch their kids. When they do, they're kind of neglectful towards their kids. But one particular night, the father kept throwing the daughter across the pool. And like the daughter was crying and crying. And so finally, a man, like another man who was swimming, got involved and was like, you need to stop treating your ch children this way. And then I had to get involved. So it was this big confrontation. And you can tell there was a lot of just tension. I didn't want to get involved because I didn't really want to go in between these people. The man felt really uncomfortable because he felt bad telling somebody how to parent their children. And then the Robinson man felt was really upset that somebody was questioning his, his um, parenting habits. So there was just a lot of dissonance. There was just this tension. They were very uncomfortable. Um, I also found that parents produce stress for themselves out of embarrassment. So families will, or parents are, they don't like it whenever their children cross into other people's boundaries. So they will apologize and they get really embarrassed and it causes a lot of stress for themselves. So as an example of this, this is an example from my field notes. Um, so I'll just read it. A little boy ran into me, he was probably about four or so, and his mom immediately told her son to apologize and she apologized to me as well. I could tell that she was embarrassed but the son showed no remorse. I said it was okay and that her little boy was very cute. Her response was around the lines of thanks he tends not to watch where he's going. And she continued to apologize repeatedly after this until she left. She just, I'm so sorry about that, I'm so sorry about that. She was very stressed that her child ran into me and crossed that boundary between us. Um, as for socioeconomic status and, uh, um, and ethnicity, I didn't find any significant differences by themselves, but when I combined them, I did notice a, a huge difference. So if I combine, combine the higher socioeconomic status in the Caucasians or the high spending in the Caucasians, I found that there was more family time emphasis. These are the parents that force their children to know, stay here with me, don't go by yourself, talk to me, how was your day, um, what have you been doing? And they kind of forced it. Even if their children tried to move away, they pushed them right back in. For lower socioeconomic status in Caucasians, it was the exact opposite. There was a least supervision. They just kind of wanted them to go away. Like, okay, I'm here, you go away from me. And I noticed this in the Robinsons that I said previously, but also the walkers. This is a single father, and he will come in, drop his kids off, and go wait in his truck the entire time. And if I you know, say, like, hey, your son did this, he'll be like, oh, kids will be kids, and he'll just kind of brush it off. He does not want to be involved at all. 
Um, as for Hispanics, I noticed that they were strict, but not harsh. And what I really noticed was that there was no added effort. They didn't have to tell their kids to stay here. They just did. They just, they knew where they were supposed to be. They knew what they were supposed to be doing. But what I found really interesting was I found this like phenomena of birthday parties. So one particular day, there was two birthday parties. One was a ca Caucasian birthday party. It was just a mom, about five girls, maybe about 12 or so, and that was it. There was decorations, there was a huge like extravagant cake, and the mom gave me her credit card and said, let them spend whatever they want. And they, <laughs> they spent about $150 worth of candy and some toys. That same day, there was a Hispanic birthday party, and it was huge. There were so many people there. Um, to be quite honest, I don't even know who the birthday boy or girl was. Um, they brought in their own food. They didn't buy anything from us. They kept to themselves, and it was huge. It was more so like a party instead of focused on the birthday person. And I, saw, I found that that difference was really interesting. Um, here's an example of a upper, um, higher socioeconomic status Caucasian family. Um, pretty much in short, there was a woman and her two children, probably age three and five. And the oldest son, could, you could tell, had been swimming for a while. And he wanted to go out on his own. He wanted to go to the diving boards. He wanted to do his own thing. But the mom was like, nope, you can't go until the younger son. Because the younger son, he couldn't swim. He was crying. He was really scared. Um, and she just kept bringing him back, making him talk to her. Um, the, for a long time, like, they would get, the, the older son was getting really impatient, but the mom and the dad didn't care. They're like, no, you're staying right here with me at all times. Um, my final finding was with the gender of the parents. I found the exact same thing as Jansen did. The fathers are more physically disciplining. They were more likely to just pick up their kids and spank them and go on their way. Whereas mothers would be like, if you don't stop, I'm going to do this. If you don't stop, I'm going to do this, but never actually doing it. Um, something that I noticed that I didn't find in the research were single parents. So with single parents, I noticed that they either took on both roles or they took on neither. So I already talked about the walkers and how he kind of just completely was absent. There's another single father, which I'll show you in the next slide, who he was really, he wanted to be nurturing, but he also wanted to be a disciplinarian. So he really took on both roles. Um, I also noticed that when the breadwinner status changed, there was also a difference. So there is one particular family that I can exemplify this. So it's a migrant family. They come to the pool about once a year, um, whenever they're doing the end of the harvest stuff. And all of the men, you can tell, work in the fields. They're really dirty, tired when they get home, when they get to the pool. But there's a woman who's always dressed in business attire. She's always very, you know, done up. And you get, I made, or what I attributed to is that she made a little bit more money than her husband did. And so it changed. She was a disciplinarian. She spanked the kids. The, the man was more nurturing than, and I, so I just thought it was interesting how that, when the status changes, the roles change as well. Um, so as an example of a single father who took on both roles, so this was the pretty much the only dialogue I actually did, and it was because I actually knew the man. So he said, my girls are raised to show respect. And I said, how did you teach them that? And he said, since they were little, they learned their manners and knew that their elders should be called Mr. and Mrs. They know that if they are talking to an adult, that they must be respectful. And I asked him, when your girls act up, what do you do? And he said, I spank them or ground them. That teaches them to listen to me. You never worry about them hating you. And he said, they might hate me at first, but they will respect me later, which is more important. So he took a really hands-on role with his children's upbringing. So in conclusion, I found that it was rare to see families associated with other families unless they knew them. They kind of formed this little invisible boundary around themselves, and they didn't really want anybody to intrude on that. With higher socioeconomic status and Caucasians, they actively produced this family time, and they forced it in, in, a, few, in a few instances. I attributed this to they have high demanding jobs, but they do have recreation time. So when they do have time off, they want to make the most of it. With low socioeconomic status and Caucasians, they have really emotionally and physically draining jobs. Therefore, when they want to relax, children aren't really a factor in relaxation. They want their kids to kind of go away. The hot spring is a place to relax, so they want to be by themselves and not deal with the daily stresses that they deal with every day. And for Hispanics, I found that family time was more natural than forced. As for gender, like I said before, fathers are more physically disciplining and harsher. Mothers are more verbally disciplining. Um, so for, as the project itself, there were some ethical concerns. I felt a lot of discomfort observing these families. Um, families is a really private and kind of, 
it's pretty much just a really private thing that it feels uncomfortable sp spying practically on another family. So I felt a lot of tension with that. And also I had a lot of limits. So for one, my interpretation of events, especially with the economic status. I had to completely assume. I could have been completely wrong. Um, so that definitely hel holds back my project a, a little bit, but I did with what I could. Um, also, the patrons of the pool could be a special sample. It's not free to go to the pool. So there could have been a special sample that <coughs> said that if they are going to the pool, they might be different than people who can't afford to go to the pool at all. So as for further research, I want to do many, many more hours of observation. I only did 12. I'd like to do a lot more. And I'd also like to look at more public venues, especially free public venues. So a fair, a uh, park, um, something around those lines so I can actually see a wide diverse of individuals, especially observe more diverse demographics. I only had Caucasians and Hispanics, so I'd like to look at more demographics as well. But as a whole, I found that families are organized in, um, are an organized group in public settings just like they are in home. They have a way of organizing themselves and how to handle stresses. Um, so what I um, concluded from this is that family foundations and family life is created from multiple aspects, from the home life and their private life. There's a lot of different aspects that produce a family and the unique individual characteristics of the family itself. A lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen a lot of um, families where they probably should be not doing that in public, but um, it's a lot of stress too. It's really dangerous. You know, their children can drown at any moment. So I think there's a lot of they are already tense because there's so many other people there. And it's really dangerous. So I do see a lot of dysfunction at times. <laughs> <coughs> Does the age of the children make any difference, or did you, were you able to see some trends there? Um, I didn't notice any, but I also wasn't looking for any. Okay. Um, in further research, I would like to look at different genders of children and see. Were most of the children younger children? Yeah, um, most of them were older children, or younger children, I mean. Um, I think I kind of gravitated towards families that did have you know younger children, because then I can actually, oh, that is their kids, instead of, oh, that's their brother or something. So. Um, but I definitely in the future, I would like to look at if different ages either loosen the tension for the parents or increase the tension. In your answer about discipline, you mentioned the physical threat of drowning, but you also mentioned there are other people there, and you mentioned embarrassment earlier, the uh -huh. social threat. So do you have any feel for how much the discipline is around the physical threat of drowning versus social threat of embarrassment of doing something wrong? Um. I bet you it was a combination of both, but if I could, if, if I can, yeah, I, yeah, I think it? it would be more so <coughs> of the stress from the other people. Mm -hmm. um, I know like when I was growing up, my mom would really stress out about other people being around and us bugging other people more so than us getting lost. So I think even though both play a factor, I think the stress of having other people around would definitely cause more of the anxiety that causes to the discipline. Mm -hmm. Oh, there goes my poster. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, that's actually a really good question. I didn't look at that. Um, I did notice that if it was a big group, they didn't really have that. It didn't really apply to them. So if it was a large family, um, like. Like, say, for example, a big birthday party, they would kind of split up into their own little sections. But as for, um, like, the, di I guess I could say, so since the lower economic status Caucasians, like, they didn't really have that family time, they didn't really form that amoeba in the same way. So I could definitely say there was a difference there. Um, but as for the size of the family, I didn't really see a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. How did you determine what race somebody is? I feel like that's kind of like judging a book by itself. That's very true. Um, like I said, it was kind of the same as the socioeconomic status. I kind of had to deal with what I had. Um, so I just looked primarily at that, especially like Caucasian and Hispanics. Like I tried not to mix them up too bad, but I, I guess I just tried my best is my answer to that. But you're right. Like um, th there was definitely a lot of my own perception of that.
Um, I didn't have an instance of that. Um, I didn't just look at families with the mom and dad. I did look to see if there was just a mom or just a dad. And also I looked, there were some families who even had a friend there or a grandparent there with them and said I did look at them too. And so that's kind of what I um, categorized into the solo parents where there could have been a father or a mother present, but they just had somebody else with them at the time. But as for mother or father, father, mother, mother, I didn't, I didn't see any instances of that that I noticed. Can you maybe talk to this, too, about the gender roles Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would. It would. I, I think there would definitely be some differences in there. Mm -hmm. was, was it Mr. Robinson? Robertson. Mm -hmm. Did you? Or Robinson, actually. <laughs> I did not, um, since I was, I took on the strictly participant role, um, and really whenever I had to interject, I didn't do it from a research perspective, I did it because more so that's like my job. So I kind of like took a back, the, the research kind of took a back seat and I'm more so focused on me like partaking in what I was supposed to do. Um, I don't know if I ever would follow up because I don't know if that would cause some, make them upset that I was looking at them in, in a deeper level than what they thought I was. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Hispanic families seem less forced to be together. Mm -hmm. um, was that constant across the socio-demographic? And did families who especially seem that way have other cultural practices that might suggest the cultural difference? Um, I didn't, it was a lot easier to decide, I'm trying to say how to word this. For as for Hispanics, I couldn't. I didn't really categorize them into different um, socioeconomic statuses. I couldn't really. I, I just didn't really have enough information to do it, uh, so I didn't really look at that. I just separated them amongst Caucasians. Um, but coming for personally from a Hispanic family, I can say that they do that. Um, there are. It's more whenever you go out to do something, you want to do it as a family as a whole. Um, versus, you know, one of t you do it to spend time with the family, I guess. I don't know how to answer it exactly. <laughs> um, but as for Hispanics, I, I kind of took it from like my own personal perspective, and then yes, there are different cultural, cultural yeah. norms for that. Okay. Okay. Might be done as other people walking in. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys.